Hello everybody, it is Caleb and welcome to your C++ video. This video we're going to be talking about the basics of C++ and also the introduction of data types because we're going to get into some data structures and algorithms in C++. Now, if you're new, we're going to take it fairly slow, cover some of the basics, but if you're having a hard time learning any of it, I do have a C++ 10 hour tutorial if you have nothing better to do with your life. But besides that, we're just going to jump in and just try to have some fun with this. And a few things I just wanted to call out. First thing is we are in a notebook environment, so I can go in here and I can make titles and I can change the code and get the output all in one spot. So it's a really nice organized way of working with things. The C++ version here is 17, although you don't have to be using C++ 17 if you're on an older version. And more than likely, a lot of you aren't going to be in this notebook environment and you're gonna have a C++ environment set up locally for you to code in. But if you don't, here's my two suggestions. One, you can get the same exact environment set up by going to jupyter.org and saying, try in your browser and selecting C++. Give this a second to load and this will set up an environment for you to work in. I would personally just consider this to be a sandbox environment. Don't put any really important code in here. This should be for learning because if you go away and come back, your environment will basically time out and you'll lose all of your work. So don't consider this for safekeeping. If you want to keep it, what you can do is you can say file, download, and there's a bunch of different formats you can download it in, such as a notebook format, which you can then upload to GitHub or re-upload it to Jupyter to use later, whatever you want. So that's one option. And the other option would be to set up a C++ environment locally using a compiler and an editor. And for that, I'd recommend our sponsor for the series, Embarcadero. C++ Builder is the IDE of choice for rapidly building C++ applications. Utilize drag and drop visual components that are responsive and allow for cross-platform deployments. When building data-driven applications, you can bind data sources to visual components to make working with data easy. Go ahead and get started with a free trial of the Architect Edition, which will give you all of the features of C++ Builder. So whether you're a beginner just getting started or want to build enterprise level applications, C++ Builder is the tool for you. I'll leave a link in the description. So you can see there's lots of different ways to get started with C++ development. And it's more important that you understand the code and don't worry so much about the environment you're coding in because this code here is going to work the same no matter what editor or environment you're working in. Now, if I was to do a local environment with Mac, you know, I could go into my terminal and just say G++ and it'll get no input files. So then you would just pass in a C++ file, file.cpp. Um, but for me, I'm just going to go ahead and stick to Jupyter Notebooks. If you need more details on the absolute basics, again, refer to my 10 hour C++ video. It's a good way to, you know, help yourself fall asleep if you, if you can't seem to get some rest at night. So we're gonna be covering the basics and data structures and algorithms. But before we go into the details of that, we need to understand data types. So for example, do you know what this is? This is a string. Specifically, it's a string literal. It's when it's literally typed out in our code. There are other types as well, and understanding the types is extremely important in C++, especially because when we create variables, these variables are statically typed. We define what type the variables are at compile time, and we can't change the type of variables later on. So let's go ahead and say standard C out and pass in five. When we do this, we get the value five. This is an integer. There's also doubles. So we can say 5.0 and that broke it. Just as a little side note, if you're running any of these and you're getting some weird errors, like your code's exactly the same, sometimes you just need to restart and run all from the kernel. So restart the kernel. I was having issues where it was saying like uh, something, I don't know, but I had to restart the kernel and it worked fine. If you specifically need a float value for some reason, you can pass in an F. It's not really that important here because it works just fine, but when we're dealing with variables of specific types, you might need to do something like that. But let's talk about defining variables. We can create an integer very easily. Let's just say int, give it a name such as X and assign the value such as five. 
and that can be used anywhere an integer would be expected. So you can pass x to standard out. For strings, what I recommend is saying include string, and then down here we say string y and give it a value such as hello world, like so, and then passing in y here. We do need to prefix string with std as well, and then it works the same way. So this include string is going to be the C++ string, which abstracts away a lot of the difficult things that we'd have to deal with when working with strings inside of C. So we don't have to worry about the null terminating character or anything. We just assign a value of a string to a variable and then just use it like we would any other variable. So that's really nice. If you just want to use a, a character array, then just go ahead and say char, and give it some name such as A and assign it some value. And then we should be able to use A as well. And that seems to work. But overall, I prefer this technique uh, as opposed to this technique. So let's go ahead and get rid of that line there. And one other thing I wanted to teach you is that you can use a, a type such as double and you can assign it an integer and that's going to be just fine. However, it doesn't necessarily work the other way around. If we create an integer and assign it a double and it says implicit conversion from double to integer. And the reason this is a problem and it's probably a good thing that it complains about this is because we are trying to basically assign something that is wider than what we're assigning it to. So this 0.5 would essentially be cropped off and we would just have five. And you actually have to explicitly convert it to an integer, which is known as casting. So we can say int like so, and then it works. But you can see we lost some information. We no longer have this 0.5. So this cast here is like the uh, C version of casting. You'll also see the C++ version, which is static underscore cast. And then inside of lesser than greater than, we'll have the type and then the value in parentheses. And that'll work the same way. Now there's various ways of casting. This is one of the most popular. For simple things, it's really not gonna hurt if you just pass in int like so. However, this is the C++ way of doing it. Now, I did want to call out something that's really important to understand here because if you don't, it's confusing. So if you look at our code and you just reset your brain and read it one line at a time, we define this variable x, then we define this variable y, and then we output this variable a. What? Where, where is that coming from? How is it that I can run this code and this hello there just shows up out of nowhere? Well, this has to do with the way the notebook environments work. Basically, when you define a variable, that variable is going to remain defined until we reset the kernel. So if we reset and restart and run all, we're actually going to get an error. And it says interpreter error, use of undeclared identifier A. So now it's all confused, right? So this is in one way annoying, but in another way useful. It's annoying because you can be writing code and executing it thinking that it's 100% valid code, but it's actually using variables you no longer are using, such as what we were just seeing. We were using a variable A that we already deleted from our code, but it's also useful because it allows us to use variables defined in previous cells. So as an example here, let's create this variable X we'll output X and we will output Y. And then down here, I want to create a new cell, which you can hit escape and then B to go down to a new cell. And in here, we could do this again, just to show you. And this code in isolation wouldn't work because we wouldn't have the appropriate includes and we wouldn't have defined that variable X. However, if we go kernel, restart and run all, we can see that this first cell runs and it works. We get five hello world. And then this one goes off of that variable previously defined in the cell above it. This allows us to isolate specific concepts and not have to flood our code with a lot of imports or variable definition. So for example, if I wanted to make a note, I could say A to go to the cell above, M for markdown. And then in here I could do something like 
here's how to print a variable. And then render this with shift enter or control enter, I think. Yeah, I think either one of those work here. And then we can have this concept isolated. So this is a very nice environment for displaying the process of how you're building out a system. This is very popular for visualizations and data science. Especially if you're doing machine learning algorithms, you want to show how you're taking data, processing it, and show each step one at a time without just having one giant main program. This is completely different than how this might be structured in normal C++, where we would have int main, and then all of our code would be defined inside of main. And this is all we would do. Um, for the notebook to get the equivalent, we would actually have to invoke main like so to get the output. So if you want to take your notebook code and convert it to something you could use locally, you would basically take this code and then paste that in an editing environment. And then for Sublime, I would just go up to Tools, Build System, and then C++ Single File. And then I can run this code to get the values out here. So that's my introduction. This was a lot of like various topics and setup all in one video. So I apologize if we didn't go in as much depth as you may have hoped. However, it is good to know how to use these notebook environments. I think a lot of developers are gravitating this way. And I think as time goes on, the support for the notebooks and the ease of use is going to just improve. So it's not so complicated or mysterious to developers that don't come from a Python data science background where notebooks are really popular. The last thing I want to share with you is that the notes for all of these C++ videos will be a link in the description, and that will continue to be added to as we go through these videos. From here, you should just be able to launch the binder and start working with the code from the notes. So I'll update those notes with the code from this video, and then you can go experiment with it. Give us some time because this setup process takes a little bit of cooking, but eventually you'll have an environment that you can work with. Let me know what you want to see in these C++ videos and be sure to subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.